Well, good morning, everybody. Such a great start to the day. Had a great 9 o'clock and now uh, the 11 o'clock. Uh, as Tyler said, we're going to be back in our series called Summer Playlist through the Psalm, Psalm 56, if you have a copy of God's Word. Go ahead and start preparing, taking that out. We're going to jump around just a little bit, but that'll kind of be the base text for us. But, but as you're turning there, just a couple of things, uh, just kind of in the rhythm of what we do uh, around here at Journey. It's kind of something that's just a, the way the seasons go, and we're about to enter into a season of ministry with school starting up and those type of things, and that always means a lot of opportunities and uh, even some changes. Some of y'all, even probably in your personal life, maybe you're changing schools, your kids are changing classes and stuff like that at school. Uh, and so the church is no different for us. We kind of set into a pace uh, over the fall beginning in August for for a, a new season of ministry. And so I want to tell you about a couple things real quick. Uh, first one is uh, uh, we want to welcome our new pastor of administration and community, Aaron Baker. Uh, he starts tomorrow. So let's welcome him uh, onto the staff. That's going to be a really big part of what we do. Uh, we have one vision, uh, which is to continue a movement of multiplication for the glory of God. Our mission is to reach those the church have not yet reached and lead them into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. And then we have one strategy, and that's journey groups. And so uh, this is a big part of what we do. These are little house churches, if you will, a place where you can get around God's Word and in community and extend and multiply the kingdom of God through that and be equipped uh, even in, in the middle of that. And we don't just start that for adults or college students. That is uh, our strategy from uh, from our youngest sons and daughters on. And so what that also means is there are a couple of announcements. One, Promotion Sunday is coming up on August 11. We're calling it Rising Together. That's that journey group theme. Uh, we have a vision uh, of partnering with parents to fuel faith in the next generation. And what that means is, is that journey group leaders with your kids are consistent leaders with consistent friends at the same time, consistent times every week to reinforce your discipleship of your kids at home. Uh, and so this is a big day for us. This means that the uh, you'll probably most of them, I think, will have uh, the same journey group leaders they have, but they might be in a different location. But just be aware of that. Might want to get here a little bit early uh, and pr prepare for that. Our team will be getting you some information, parents, uh, about all those changes. And then there's one more change that I want to let you know about that's coming up on the same day, August 11th. On August 11th, we're going to move to a new service time schedule, and that will affect you in here, especially those of you that get here at 11.15. This will really, really affect you. Uh, we are going to a 9 a.m. and 10.45 a.m. service schedule. Uh, that's for a few reasons. One, I mentioned journey groups for our family ministries. This gives them a sustaining, sustainable rhythm. Uh, for them, our 9 o'clock leaders are in there a really long time. It balances out those hours for that. It also provides you an opportunity to create some time after the service to uh, maybe invite somebody new or connect with friends, go out to lunch, uh, spend that Sunday on, on relationships afterwards. And then it also creates for us not just a sustainable rhythm, but also momentum going forward. We believe that God is leading us into I believe this, an unprecedented time of ministry and mission and effectiveness. And so we want to get uh, everything we can to, to that effort. So on August 11th, go ahead and mark your calendars. Set your alarms just a little bit early. Uh, if you're already up, maybe just get in the car earlier or something like that. Uh, but 1045, that'll get you out at noon or 1205 rather than 1215, 1220 uh, and get you on your way and give us a lot of time of overlap with community in between. So that's where we're headed. I'll let you know about that. Um, as we thought, think about that, move into the vision for the future. Um, last week, we uh, heard from Psalm 67, uh, Chris Wilson, our connections and one of our college directors. He uh, shared with us a passage of scripture that you've been a part of if you've been here through the summer because we've been reciting a portion of it every, uh, every service at the end as a benediction, and that was on purpose. As we went into the summer, we weren't just trying to pick uh, psalms at random just to say, hey, what would fit nicely into the summer? Everybody's chill and everything like that. And let's do this thing called Summer Playlist. Uh, we really wanted to build it around uh, the Psalms because Psalms is an ancient hymn book where it's really about worship and engaging with God. Uh, it really deals with really personal relationship issues with God, and it also prepares our minds and hearts to move forward. And so Psalm 67 was a thing that we wanted to wrap everything around because what it talks about is our vision to extend the gospel to all people groups of all nations. And so that's what we're really about, how we exist. But uh, what we've learned from that is a lot of things. There's a a lot of reasons why that doesn't happen. Matter of fact, I mean, there's a difference between saying, hey, that's our vision. That's what we believe. 
and actually seeing it come to fruition. You've probably even realized that even in your own life. There's probably things that you've had really great ideas about, you've had a great vision for in your own life, and maybe it didn't really play out. It didn't really come to fruition. You weren't able to implement it. And that could be for a lot of reasons. A situation could have changed. Uh, maybe there was just like you just didn't have a good plan to implement, a strategy, and even though you had a desire, you didn't have a good strategy for it. But what I've also learned is there's, there's this thing that happens in us, especially with things of God, and trying to move forward in vision in our lives, and even as a church, to move forward, that there's this thing out there that uh, actually has the ability oftentimes to um, set us off course, uh, to take the wind out of ourselves, uh, to make it to where we look up five years and we actually haven't done anything, we haven't actually accomplished this big idea. Uh, I started to experience this early on uh, in, my, in my walk of faith. I didn't always go to church, but when I started, I was really in junior high, got into a senior high. was when I really started to, I would say, grow in my faith, had some people that would challenge me, invest in me, and stuff like that. And in about 10th grade, there was a, an evangelist that came through town, uh, and I went to the service. And uh, I listened to all of it, and I, I, it was the first time that I'd ever heard about uh, uh, opposition, spiritual opposition. I didn't, even, I didn't even know that was a thing. I mean, I, I was thinking, well, hey, man, I'm living my life, I'm going to school, I'm doing all these things, uh, I'm in clubs and organizations, and uh, like everybody does, every student does. But I didn't know that there was a spiritual thing that was happening all around me. I was just kind of in my lane doing my thing. And in about 10th grade, I kind of woke up to this concept, and I started to realize, well, I don't really face a lot of spiritual opposition in my life because I'm not very dangerous to the enemy. Enemy. And so I started to make these commitments. I'm like, okay, God, I'm going to go to same, uh, same teams, same organizations, same classes, and I'm going to go back with purpose. I'm going to go and I'm going to start sharing Christ with my friends. I'm going to try to grow. I'm going to invite them to church. I'm going to do all this. And then what I realized over 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, and even today, is the idea of that is a lot more difficult than actually stepping into that. When the conversations don't go well, when the opposition starts to arise, and I'm not talking about anybody like saying, oh, you're a Christian, I'm trying to keep you back. I'm just talking about just the natural ebb and flow of trying to make influence in people's lives. It was a lot harder than I anticipated. Even move forward, fast forward into uh, Veronica and I when we got engaged. I remember us praying. We prayed one simple prayer. We didn't think it was that big of a deal at the time, but we prayed, God, would you do something extraordinary uh, in our marriage, in our relationship, and in our lives? We got together and we would pray that on repetition. It was kind of be the repeat button on our playlist, if you will. We were praying this thing, uh, but what we realized 24 years in is what we thought we knew then, we didn't really know how hard it would be to actually embody that and implement that and walk in faith and power in that. So 24 years in, that means a lot more now than it even did then because we've got some water under the bridge. There's been some scars through that. There's been some difficulties through the opposition of that. There's been times when we wanted to cash it all in and forget about all that stuff and just live life. And then there's some other things. Like I've, I've realized it with church. Same thing with church. Uh, not just me, not just our marriage, but I've realized it in church. I remember in my 20s, uh, I knew God was calling me to plant a church or calling us to plant a church, and we were talking about it and, and all that kind of stuff. And I had big ideas. I mean, I had really big ideas about what it would look like, how it should look, because, you know, usually that's the start. He's like, well, it should look like this, and church should look like that. And I had all these big ideas, and uh, I think all the ideas were good, all right, because... I think my ideas are good most of the time, just like you do, and I thought they were really good, but what I realized is implementing those ideas and facing the opposition was a lot more difficult. Something different than being a Monday morning quarterback spiritually in life when you're the one taking the hits, it's just a lot harder. And so the question today, the reason I say all that is to say this, is if God is truly calling us into a vision of multiplication for the glory of God, if that's really what He's doing, it's one thing to put that on a piece of paper or make a pretty sign and say that. It's another thing for you to say, yeah, I want to do that. I want to be a part of that. And it's quite another to actually follow through on that and to know that when you make the commitment, when you have the idea, when God impresses it on your spirit and your heart to do it, that that can mean oftentimes that following Jesus looks like running for your life. There are going to be times in your faith and in your walk and in your calling and in your mission and us as a church when the very things that we think God is all about and has called us to became the very things that create opposition don't discourage it. And so what we're going to look today is we're going to look at the story uh, and, and kind of the heart behind what does it take then to continue to recalibrate and to come back and build faith in the face of fear. 
Not just because of something we've done, because we've been in sin and discipline, but because we really try to do the right thing, trying to do good things, and we're being met with opposition. How are we next year, next month, and next 10 years, how are we going to walk into those seasons, and what do we need to do to continually recalibrate so that we walk in faith to the vision that God has given us as individuals and as a church? In order to do that, we're going to look at the story uh, of David and the reflection of his heart as it's outlined in Psalm 56. So uh, if you've got a copy of God's Word, hopefully you've got it open. I gave you plenty of time to do that. Uh, or open it up on your phone. And the first thing you're going to see is something you don't always see in Psalms, but it's going to help us out a lot. And we're going to draw away four things in the end that I want you to jot down on paper. But we're going to start with the story and the starts that leads us in uh, through a title at the top of Psalm 56. If you look at your copy of God's Word, what you're going to hear, it, you're going to see it say is to the choir master. Okay, so it's a hymn that's been written to hand over to the choir master so that it can be sung by a choir to God's people according to the dove on uh, far off terebinths. That sounds beautiful. Basically what that is is there's a song they all knew. He wrote words and they put the two together. It's kind of like uh, uh, ancient sampling, if you will. Right? It's kind of like taking a song that everybody knows, taking new words, putting it on it, and they go, oh, I know that song, and they can sing the words more readily that way. And so that's kind of what's going on. Uh, a miktam of David, nobody even knows what that is. Uh, everything I've studied, nobody knows what that is. Uh, when the Philistine seized him in Gath. That's what we need to know. When the Philistine seized him in Gath. Now, when we read Psalm 56, the psalmist puts in there the situation. And so for us to understand the meaning behind it and the correlations we're going to draw from it, we really have to understand what was happening and what got David to a spot where he was seized by the Philistines in a place called Gath. What was going on? Well, to get that, you kind of have to back up into the story. And it really, that story, that story in Psalm 56 that he's reflecting on actually began on another day. And it was a famous day. It was a day when uh, he strolled out on a battlefield and there was a big giant and he was uh, challenging God's people and he was pushing back and railing against them and everybody was cowering. Even King Saul was cowering in his chambers and wouldn't come out of the tent. And uh, he was defying the armies of God, defying the character of God. And uh, David simply shows up with lunch for his brothers and when he shows up, he's like, hey, when... Why is nobody fighting that guy? And everybody's like, hey man, calm down. Uh, you're, you're a little out of your league. And at the end of the story, you know how it goes probably, or you can look it up. He strolls to the brook, gets a few pebbles, slings one of them, hits the guy in the head. He falls. And he doesn't stop there. He walks up to the guy, takes his own sword, Goliath's sword, cuts his head off. That's a really good church story right there, right? Takes his head, parades it around because he's the victor. And that starts a cycle of things. It was a very successful day. I mean, I, I don't know if you've had a successful day before in your life where God really came through, God really moved, you were a part of it, and everybody saw it, and like, man, that guy's really walking with God. I mean, there's nobody there that day that could have looked at that and said, I mean, that's not a miraculous thing. Miraculous things can cause different responses, though. Some people can be encouraged and exuberant about it, and some people can feel threatened by it. And that's exactly what happened that day. See, David didn't know this, and you could call it youthful exuberance or being naive or whatever it is, or by being, just being an idealist. But I think at a young age, David, he, he had a simple faith where he had followed God. He knew he had been anointed by God, and so he was just walking in it. He was kind of uh, outside the realm of all that is out there to really follow God. He was just doing the thing in front of him. And, hey, it's a, it's a lion, sure. It's a bear, okay. It's a giant. Hey, that's all good. All right. No big deal. I'm young. I believe I've got faith. But what he didn't expect is that the moment of his success with God was going to bring about some other things. It was going to bring pushback, difficulty, and ultimately the success that was beginning on that day in the eyes of Saul was going to push against everything he had. He walked in and not knowing it, but what he was about to find out is that walking with God and following a calling looks like running for your life. He ends up in the throne room with uh, Saul. Saul starts throwing spears at his head. He starts ducking. And so Saul concocts a plan. He says, i got to get rid of this guy. Let me put him in charge of an army. Let me send them out to fight. Because the odds were he wasn't going to make it. I mean, maybe this was just a, 
a, a one-time moment. Maybe this was a one-hit wonder, if you will, with David. And surely, if he gets out on the battlefield, we can get rid of him, and then everybody will be coming back to me. All the people will be giving accolades to me. But it didn't happen that way. God continued to show David favor. He continued to lead armies, and he started to get older. A, a guy that started with no facial hair started to grow kind of that little peach fuzz on his face. He started to grow up, and he started to command not just army, but he started to command respect of everybody around him. And he would come back off the battlefield, and they would start to sing his praise. The women would run out as the armies would come out, and they started saying things like, Saul's slain his thousands, and David has slain his ten thousands. And in 1 Samuel eighteen fifteen, Saul responds, and when he saw how successful he was, he became afraid of him. He started to feel threatened. He wasn't threatened by David's failure. He was threatened by David's success. Still unknowingly, David continues just to st- continue to try to be obedient to God, try to do the next right thing. He tries to obey and honor the king. And as time would roll on, if you, stop, if you skip down after he sends him back out to the Philistines once again to fight, he comes back and once again David wins. He doesn't lose. He's successful again. And Saul starts to solidify in his reasoning and his heart. He realized that the Lord was with David. And this is getting serious, Saul would say. And that his daughter Michal loved David. It's getting personal. And Saul became still more afraid of him and he remained his enemy for the rest of of his life. All this was happening simply because David was following the call of God on his life. He was continuing to execute and implement. It wasn't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but he was on a trajectory. He was trying to do the next right thing. Well, following 1 Samuel 18, you can read it, and I highly suggest it. Maybe a thing I've been doing over the last couple of weeks even would be helpful to you. I mean, just take the version app on your phone. When you get in the car, just hit play uh, and listen to Scripture. Don't listen to it to study it first. Listen to it to hear it as a story in which it was written. And the story of David's life, as you listen to it, you start to see this is like a major motion picture. This is cinematography at its best, right? David starts to run. He concocts this plan with Saul's son, Jonathan, and they have this conversation. And he's like, hey, man, I think your dad's trying to kill me. And Jonathan says, well, he doesn't do anything without telling me first, so I'll let you know. And they concoct this plan, and it's really elaborate and detailed, so I don't have time to tell it to you, but you can look at it for yourself. But what it ends up happening is Jonathan confirms that Saul says, finally, it's time for you to go kill David. I want all my men on this. we got to take him out. I'm tired of David. And so Jonathan lets David know through a sign, and he goes on the run. And as he's on the lamb, as he's on the run, he runs to a faraway place, and he runs to a priest. In 1 Samuel 21, verse 8, David finds the priest, Ahimelech, and he asks him, don't... uh, uh, He asks the priest, don't you have a spear or a sword here? He's empty-handed. He's running for his life. I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was urgent. He tells this lie because he doesn't want it to get back to King Saul where he is. He wants it to sound like he's not running. He's actually going somewhere on a mission from the king. And so he's trying to be coy about it a little bit with the priest. And so the priest, Ahimelech, replies to him, and this is what the priest says, The sword of Goliath the Philistine whom you killed in the valley of Eli is here. It's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There's no sword here but that one. And David said, there is none like it. Give it to me. Now, this is like, man, this is like a picture. Can you not see this? I mean, he's there, and the last time he saw this sword, he held it. And when he held it the last time was when he had just had the highest moment of victory in the nation of Israel, the highest moment probably in his life where everybody was cheering and chanting and people were... It's, it's, it's a story that started all. And now he's holding the very sword, but now he's in a different spot. The situation's different. What's happened now is what happened to a prepubescent boy, peach buzz on his face now with a beard... There's some years under the, uh, underneath him. There's some water under the bridge. And he's now at a spot where everything has changed and he's holding the same sword. I don't know what goes through your mind in a time like that. Well, maybe I do. Psalm 56 probably tells us. But something happened on that day when he healed that sword. That day, it would say in verse 10, 
That day David fled from Saul, and he went to Achish king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David the king of the land? As he was holding the sword, an idea came to him. Where's the last place that Saul would think to look for me? It's the same place that this sword came from. I mean, would you expect that if David had killed the Philistine, if he had been on battle and killed hundreds of Philistines, that the place he would run would be to the Philistines? See, this was an idea, and it was a masterful idea at that, to get to a place where he thought Saul couldn't find him. This is how desperate he was. But there was a problem. I don't know if he thought, it just naive again, and he thought he could get in and kind of be undercover and nobody would recognize him, but that was not the case. As soon as he walked in, they said, isn't this David? Isn't this the king of the land? And they even went to his reputation. Isn't he the one that they sing, sing about in their dances? Saul has slain the thousands and David his ten thousands. David took these words to heart, and he was very much afraid of Achish, king of Gath. Gath, the hometown, hometown of Goliath, the Philistine he enslaved, he's now recognized having run for his life, and now he thought he was safe, but he's still not safe. Achish, the king of all the Philistines, is there, and now he's going to know that this mighty general is now in his midst, and he's alone, and he's defenseless. So what do you do? I mean, really, really what, what do you do if that's you? I mean, the answer is, I have no idea what you do. And I think that's what happened with David. I think he didn't have any idea. And so he did the first thing he could think of, which would happen in verse 13. He pretended to be insane. <laughs> like, okay, just act crazy. All right, let's just act crazy in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman. And he made marks on the door of the gate. And the idea is that he was actually taking the sword of Goliath, and he was marking on the gate with the sword, and he was letting spit, saliva, run down his now well-formed beard. What a sight. Major general, victory on the battlefield, standing for faith as a young boy. But some things have happened. Some difficulties have arisen. And this is the time when you're all alone, you're feeling attacked, and you're wondering what you do because you're afraid. So when you get to Psalm 56, this is the setting. How did Achish respond? You need to know that, and then we'll get into it. Achish responded this way. He said to his servants, Look at the man. He's insane. Why bring him, him to me? Am I so short of madmen that you have to bring this fellow here to carry on like this in front of me? Which means he's got a lot of crazy people, which is kind of funny to me. Must this man come into my house? I got plenty of crazy people. I don't need one more. I don't need any more drama. Anybody give an amen to that? All right. I don't want anybody any more drama in my house. I don't need it. I'm done. Get rid of it. So we know what Akesh was thinking, but what was David thinking? Well, it's what you heard Tyler read before I ever got up to speak. And we're going to go through this really quick because there's four quick things I want you to see out of this because I think what you find is the tension and the fight between fear and faith of what it looks like when opposition comes, not because you failed, but because you succeeded. And what does it take to continually recalibrate for the fight ahead, knowing the mission's not done? So how does he start? Well, let's just break it down real quick. Psalm 56, Be gracious to me, O God, for a man tramples on me all day long, and an attacker oppresses me. My enemies trample on me all day long, for many attack me proudly. Now, there's a few things on that. The first thing is this, that, that you realize he's alone. All right, We've established that. When you're alone, who do you call to? There's no more friends. His closest confidant, Jonathan, is a long way away. Uh, the, the people nearest to him either think he's crazy and believe him, or if they knew he wasn't crazy, would kill him. There's nowhere for him to go, nowhere for him to run. And so what does he do? He does the only thing left to do. And he says, God, God, be gracious to me. Be merciful to me. I, I don't know what to do. You know, it's okay just to be like that. You don't have to be strong all the time. You don't have to have it all figured out all the time. You, even if people are looking to you and you're supposed to be the spiritual leader, you're supposed to be in charge, you're supposed to have it together, it's okay. Sometimes it's the best leadership to stop and say, God, I just need your grace. I just need your mercy. I don't know what to do. Here's the situation. Man, trample on me. 
all day, all day long. They trample on me. My attackers oppress me. My enemies, they trample on me all day long. You know what this is? This is relentless, overwhelming. This is not just loneliness alone. This is an attack. This is what it's like to the relentless onslaught of feeling like as soon as it rains, it pours. I feel like I'm just trying to do the right thing and I feel like everything is coming against me. Everything is warring against me. And to make matters worse, it's not just relentless. It's completely unchecked. For many attack me. And how do they attack me? They attack me proudly. Why? Because they can't. They've got the force. They've got the power. They've got the ability. And so I can just do what I want to do. And it's like they, you're starting to engage with God on a real practical, personal level. God, I need you to be gracious to me because this is relentless right here. I thought I had a plan. My plan didn't work. I got the sword. It does me no good. I have to act like I'm crazy just to make it through. There is nothing left for me to do and to make matters word. They are arrogantly gloating over me, and it seems like you're endorsing them, not me. You see, this is what it's like to follow God sometimes. Why? Because sometimes following Jesus looks like running for your life. See, this is not palatable oftentimes to the American dream or American Christianity. We like to think that if we follow God, and some preachers will tell you this, well, if you follow God, God will just make everything work. But oftentimes God makes things worse when you follow Him. What if He doesn't make everything work, but He makes everything worse sometimes? Why? Because He's got a bigger plan. He's writing a bigger story. And you're in the middle of His story. He's not in the middle of yours. People say all the time, why don't you invite God into your story? Invite God into your life. How about God invites you into His story, and He invites you into His life? That's a completely different proposition in following God. And in order for us to be seasoned for the battle ahead, we're going to have to change our thinking that God's not coming for our story He's riding us into His. And that means that oftentimes following Him looks like running for your own life. They're trampling on me. It's relentless. It's unchecked. And so what do you do if you're alone and you're attacked? Well, you do the thing that you do. You're afraid. Verse 3, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God, whom, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? Do you see the tension in that same, and just in those two verses? First he says, when I am afraid, which means you're going to be afraid. David's saying, I am afraid. When I am afraid. There's things that I'm, I'm afraid of. But then he turns around just a few short sentences. He says, I shall not be afraid. So which is it, David? Which is it when, it, when it's you? I know myself, I will turn on a dime. There will be a moment, I mean, within a split second where I've got all the faith, I think, in the world to charge a mountain, and then I'll turn right around a split second later, and I will lose all faith, and I can think, I can list for you a hundred things that could go wrong. And I can think about how, what, what's not right. And I can oscillate between this tension. Why? Because here's the thing that you have to understand that the key between fear and faith is not the, uh, not the eradication of fear completely. It's walking into the battle and fighting for faith in the face of fear. You see, to follow God, to actually follow Him, you have to realize that faith is not a feeling. Faith is something that's built. So in order to understand it, the first of the four things, what do we go to when we're attacked alone and afraid, the first thing that we go to is look at that verse in a different way. We go to His Word. When I am afraid, what do I? I put my trust in you, in God, whose Word I praise. So faith is something that you have to build. It, you have, it has to begin and be birthed, obviously, but it's something that has to be then built. He says, I put my trust in you. That, what does that mean? That faith is not normal, nor is it natural. If you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden, now it's just natural for you to always have faith and never be afraid. You have to continually put your trust in God. Now, how does that happen? Well, it happens the same way in every situation that it does initially in your relationship with God. Um, those of you in here that you would say that you know that uh, you could use different words for that, you might say you're born again. That's a Bible word, by the way, John 3. It says you must be born again in order to enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus said that. 
right? So that's a Bible word, be born again. You might say the word saved. That's kind of one that's popular in the South and Southern culture and stuff like that. That just means that you've been rescued from your sin, and now you're alive to Christ. That's all that means, right? You might say, I'm a follower of Christ. Uh, if, you, if you're really into that, you might say, well, I'm a disciple of Christ. Depending on how you say it, it all started the same way, no matter how you term it. Uh, the way it happened was that you put your trust in Jesus, but you did that in response to His Word. Because His Word and His character cannot be separated. They're inseparable entities. Right? So think about it. How does one become born again? How does one become saved? And that will help us to understand how we continually put faith in the same way. Well, Romans ten seventeen really simply, succinctly says it. It says this, Consequently, faith comes from somewhere. It's not a feeling. It's not magic. Nobody gives it to you. Nobody prays and gives you faith. Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word about Christ. So how does salvation, born again, follow Jesus, how does that happen for anybody that's happened to? And this would be something to listen in if you haven't done that, because this is the only way it happens, is that you don't just drum up commitment to God. You don't say, I'm going to do better. I'm going to start going to church more. Uh, I'm going to try to be a good Christian, be a good dad, be a good husband, be a good wife, be a good mom. You don't say any of that. What you say is, what has God revealed? And what we know is that God has revealed Himself to us. How has He done that? He's done that through His written Word. The way that you got saved or you will get saved is someone tells you, hey, did you know that you're, you're caught up in your sins and trespasses and the wages of sin is death? Well, no, I didn't. Let's talk about that. Did you know that God, because you could not work your way to Him, came for you through the person of Jesus Christ? He lived a sinless life. He died on a cross for your sins. He was buried for that, absorbing the wrath that you deserved, the wages that you earned, you earned from that. He was resurrected back to life to overcome sin and death on your behalf. And He says that if you will put your faith and trust in Him, that you now can be freed from your sin. Do you want to do that? Yes, I do. Or no, I don't. Faith is a response to a message that has been revealed. That's all faith is. Do you trust in that or not? So when you, with salvation, when it's presented to you, do you put the full weight of your existence on that reality? So, as an illustration, if that's the way it happens with salvation, the biggest thing in your life, how do you think faith will be instigated and calibrated and reinforced in your life and other situations. Exact same way. Exact same way. What does God say? What has God revealed? And how can I put my trust in that despite everything else I see? Because everything else that you see will bombard you. The opposition, the world, the flesh, and the devil. All right, Just the world we're in. It's not conducive to your calling. Right? Your flesh is not conducive to your calling. You have urges and appetites that will lead you astray. And then you have an adversary that's working against you. He's looking to take you out. So what do you do to prepare yourself for those things? You do what he said, what, what David was doing in the midst of doing it. He was embracing the tension and he was working it out through prayer and through worship. He was saying, listen, I am afraid but I put my trust in you, God, and I put my trust in what you've said. And he had something to go back to because there was a calling on his life that happened in the house one day when Samuel the priest came and anointed his head with oil and said, you're going to be king. And at this point, he's running from the king. Not only is he running from a king, he's running from two kings, Saul and Achish, at the same time. And he is not king. So what does he do? He has to go back to what has already been revealed so that he could have trust and strength to move forward in faith, not fear. This happens continuously in our life. It's not a one-time deal. You have to put your faith somewhere. It has to come from somewhere, right? And so what do we do? We begin to prepare for the battle systematically by being in God's Word daily. That's why your time with, uh, in God's Word is not a morality exercise. It's not a religious exercise. You're going to have to have it because there's going to be moments in your life where you, you are going to have to overcome fear and follow in faith in order to do what God's called you to do. And so it's necessary for you to be in God's Word every day. It's necessary for you to be in a journey group. 
so that you can be with other people and look at God's Word in community, and they can challenge you, and you can pray for one another and reinforce that. And it's going to be necessary that you worship with a larger body of believers so that you can get the Word into you on a regular basis, and you can ask the Lord to kind of teach you and, and shape you through that. Why? Because you need it. It is the lifeblood of a life of faith. You cannot have faith apart from the Word of God because it's not a feeling. So what do you do? You continue to impress upon it. Why? Because when the day comes when you're afraid, you have to have a resource of the Word to come back to, to have, to have faith, not fear. So that's the first thing. Second thing, and i got to get really going fast. Second one is this. We look not just to His Word, but we look to His character. Psalm 56, All day long they injure my cause. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They stir up strife. They lurk. They watch my steps as they have waited for my life. For their crime will they escape? In wrath, cast down the peoples. Oh, God. Now, this gets kind of, ah, okay, all right. This is serious. But what is he doing? He's calling out to the character of God. How many hunter, hunters do we have in the room? People that hunt things. Raise your hand. It's a safe environment. One, two. That's about what I thought, about five of you. All right, never mind. So it's going to be a really good illustration. All right. Um, when you go hunting, here's what you do. First thing you do is you lurk. All right. <laughs> You didn't know you were doing that. But that's why you wear that camouflage, right? If you weren't lurking, you would just walk out there in your street clothes and play your music really loud and all that kind of stuff. But you got to go kind of sneak. you got to sneak out there, right? Why? Because you got something you're trying to kill. So you lurk. And then another thing that you do is they, uh, you watch those steps. You sit there and you're watching for that deer to come into the opening so that you can get a clear shot with your bow. Now, man, just a little farther. Just a little farther, just a little farther, and then it runs, right? That's the way that goes. So you're lurking, you're watching, and you're waiting. Matter of fact, some of y'all come by, you, you've been gone all weekend, your wife comes, you come in, you hug your wife, and she says, well, hey, what, did you get anything? And you said, no, I didn't get anything. I said, what'd you do? Well, I waited. That's what I did. All weekend? You know, that was a whole other conversation for another day, like... Right? But that's the way that works, right? Because you're hunting something. And so what is this saying? David feels like he is being hunted. That's what he's saying. He's being hunted. Why? Well, he's calling out to God and his character. He said, God, all I tried to do was stand up for you when nobody else would. All I tried to do was honor authority that wasn't always following you, but I tried to submit I try to be faithful in that. I try, to, uh, I try to protect your people. That's all I did. That's all I did was trying to follow you in that. This is not the situation, Psalm 51, where he's committed adultery and killed somebody. This is a situation where he did the right thing. This is not because of failure. This is because he was trying to follow God. And he does not understand. So what do you do? You appeal to what you know about God through His Word, about His character. And so what does he do? He says, God, I trust you to be the judge because I'm a really poor judge right now. Because if you gave it to me right now, here's what we all do. This is what I do. I would build, I build a platform and I tell everybody about what they did. Well, I'd tell everybody about Saul, how wrong he is, how bad he is. And you would do that because what you're trying to do is not just build a platform, you're trying to build a coalition. You want people around you that will confirm your position, will agree with you. Yeah, you're right. They're mistreating you. Yeah, you should not let that go. You've got to push back on that. Because this is the way we do when we try to enter into the position of God in a situation. We try to put ourselves in a position where we get a platform and we get a people together and we push back. We're going to push back. But what does David do? In the midst of being alone, attacked and afraid, he calls out to God's Word and he calls out to his character and says, God, I'm going to trust you to judge because here's what I've realized about myself from constant failure in this area is that I'm a really poor judge. Why? Because my character is not perfect. I am not a perfect judge. Um, I don't know everything, even though that usually when I feel like I've been wronged, I feel like I know everything. And I feel like i got enough people around me that I could push back on something. So I go talk to my friends. And it never works. Why? Why? Because God is the only judge. 
in God's people, when we're afraid, it becomes a test for us to call out and say, God, I trust your justice. I trust your judgment on this. And we know that God's judgment is real. Why? Because the cross reflects it. You see, the centerpiece of our faith is a cross, which is simultaneously two realities about God. It is the greatest paradox in all eternity how God can be completely just and full of wrath and how He can be completely merciful. But the cross is the full embodiment of all of His character because it shows the full measure of His grace for His people and the full measure of His wrath and justice. So when you look at the cross, you don't just see a love letter. You see a death sentence. That's what you see. And so what is David doing here in this situation? He's calling out to the totality of God, and he's saying, God, I trust you and all your perfect judgment and wrath to execute judgment and justice in this situation. Did you know that you can tell on people to God? It's perfectly right, good, and encouraged. you got a problem First one you run to, first one we run to is we talk to God and we appeal to God's character. God, I feel like I'm being wronged. I can't see it right now, but I know left to me in my character, I would not handle this right. God, I am calling out for your judgment on this situation, these people, and I've got to take my hands off. You see, this is what's happening inside a man in between fear and faith. This is what it looks like for us every day in our life as we pursue God's call. So you got His Word, His character, but we rely on His care. Watch this real quick. You have kept count of my tossings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? Then my enemies will turn back in the, the day when I call this I know, that God is for me. It sounds really good to say, well, God's not for you, God's for God. And that's true, God's for His glory. But can, you, can God be for God and you at the same time? Yeah. There's times in my life, I mean, I, I, I'm for all my kids. Like, I'm for them, right? And there's times when it's mutually beneficial to be for me and for them, right? But I'm for them. I don't want ill for them. So God doesn't call you to harm you. God calls you because He cares for you. And so what does David do? He has to reinforce that God cares because when you're afraid and things aren't going well and you're running for your life when you're trying to follow God... The first thing to go is your confidence that God cares about you. God, do you even care? So he doesn't ask the question. He says what is true. Why? Because he's built it on God's Word. God, I know you care. Matter of fact, you've count my tossings. You know when you're stressed out and you're turning over in your bed at night and you wake up and the sheets are all a mess, they're everywhere. Why? And you're like, man, I don't even know if I slept a wink last night. Listen, God knows. He knows. Matter of fact, as you were turning over, David said he was counting. He was counting. Not only that, but he, he sees every tear, but he doesn't just see it and have sympathy for you. He collects it, puts it in a bottle. This would have been an inventory in an arid land where they would have a, a bottle that they would put prized water in to carry it across a place to, to provide sustenance for them. Right? says that God catches your tears. You've been crying some tears? God's catching the tears. And He says, are these not written in your book? Here's what He's saying. He's saying that even the worst moments in my life, when I'm running for my life, I have the confidence of knowing that even this, too, is written in your book. And like any good book with all the rising and falling action, and I'm not a literature expert or anything like that, but I do know that there's a lot of stuff that happens from page one to the last page. There's a lot of stuff that happens. There's a lot of tension. There's a lot of relation. That's why you read it. That's why you watch the movie. And that's the way we live life. That's why it resonates with us. Because we go through stuff. Go through difficulty. If you're going to follow God, let me just tell you, you're going to need His Word, His character, and you're going to have to rely on His care. As he talks about his tears and his tossings, and the writing of God, and in the worst moments in our life, into his book to know that this, you're turning pages, you're turning pages, you're turning pages. Why? Because the resolution hasn't happened yet. There's still more pages, and he hasn't finished writing. So what is he doing? I'm casting my cares on you because I know you care for me. I think I heard that somewhere once, right? That's where he is. 
The one I'm caring about, he would say, he would finish it up, and this last two things, and we're done real quick. He says this, he says, In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, see the centrality of God's word, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? A rhetorical question, seemingly a lot, because here I am. I must perform my vows to you, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. So in the midst of all this stuff, he decides to do two things. I got to get to work. This and this alone is a powerful moment when you're afraid. Because some of us, we get so paralyzed by fear that we become inactive, and that's the first step to defeat. So what does he say? He says, I got to get up and I got to get to work. I got to perform my vows to God. God, I promised you a long time ago I was going to continue to follow you, and I'm going to continue to follow you, and I'm going to get up and go to work. There is something unglamorous but supernaturally powerful about getting up tomorrow and doing it again. The ordinary matters of faith, serving your family, serving your wife, going to your job, giving a little money continually when you're tired and everything's pushing against you. Just say, I'm going to get up again. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to push through I must perform my vows to God. I must perform my vows to God. I'm going to talk to you, God, but then I'm going to get to work. And some of us, let me just say, can I just say it real plain? Some of us in the room, we need to get to work. Sure, you're wrestling with God. Sure, there's pushback. Sure, it didn't work the way that you thought it was going to work. But David, in a situation with spit rolling off his beard, acting like a madman, makes a decision. And he says, i got to get to work. i got to take the next step. What's your next step? It's time to get to work. There's going to be moments in the life of our church in coming years where we're going to say, I'm just tired, but we got to get up and get to work. We can't sit in that posture forever. we got to continue to move forward. That is the tension between fear and faith, right? I must perform my vows to God. But He doesn't just stop with work. He turns to worship. I will render thank offerings to you. Now think about this for a second. His situation in the span of this psalm has not changed. He doesn't wait to say, God, are you going to come through and then I'm going to do it then. He says, I'm going to go ahead and worship you now. Worship in the midst of being alone. Giving, And we're not just talking about any worship. I'm, I'm talking about giving a thank offering to God. God, I thank you. Saying thank you to God when you're alone and attacked and afraid is the hardest form of worship. It goes against everything natural. Why? Because faith is not natural or normal. That's why every Sunday when you come in here, it doesn't really matter how you feel about God. I don't feel like going to church. It doesn't matter how you feel. Honestly, if you really want to walk by faith, I mean, I get it. There's sometimes, man, you have to sit there and you can't say it, but you're there. Sometimes you've got to say it through gritted teeth, and sometimes you can shout it because you believe it and you feel it. But the consistency of saying, I'm going to offer thanks before anything changes. You see, this is the way we live life. This is what it's like. Why? Because we're not there yet. It's the already not yet nature of our faith. But ultimately, it's not about your work and your worship at all. Remember, it was about His Word, His character, and... Uh, what did I say? His word. What's the other one? Yeah, yeah, whatever that was. All right. I got a lot of things going on. But the last thing was, it's not about your work and your worship at all in the end. You're just submitting to his own work. How does he end? This is what he ends, and we're done. For you have delivered my soul from death. Yes, my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. What does he rely on? God, there's something that you have done. And I love the fact that it's past tense when he's in the middle of it. He didn't say, you will deliver my soul from death. And that would make sense. He says, for you have delivered past tense my soul from death. Yes, you've kept my feet from falling, though right now I feel like I'm tripping. That I may walk before God in the light of life. I gotta get up, I gotta work, I gotta worship. But how do I do that? I gotta rely on his work. If you hear nothing else today, hear this is that it's not about your own work and your own worship. 
It's about His work on your behalf. That's the whole nature of our faith. That means that what He has done and performed perfectly for you gives us the confidence to move forward in life. What has already been done is the power to do what needs to be done. When following Jesus, when following God, feels like running for your life. We rely on His work. Some of you need to do that today. Some of you have been trying to do it yourself for too long. You're tired, you're exasperated, and it's simply because you've never relinquished control of your life to Him when the work was already done. You thought there was something left undone, and it's not. He's done. He, he did it. He said, it is finished. And today, you can stand on what He's done, and you can pull the full weight of your trust on that rather than your own performance. What good news? What good news is there? And He can send you out of this place, send us all out of this place, to live different kinds of lives with purpose and with power. So would you do that today? Would you confess your sin to Him, repent of it, put your faith and trust in Him as your Lord and Savior, and walk a new, new life? And you're going to do that right here today. I'll give you a second to do that in just a minute. What I want all of us to do, though, is I want us to all recalibrate around His Word, His character, His care. I remembered it at that time. And His work today because God is calling us individually to something and He is collectively calling us to something and it is going to mean that we are going to face opposition spiritually if we do this thing right. And so we got to get ready. It's time to get to work and start worshiping. And so I'm going to ask if you would, if you'd bow your head and close your eyes as the band comes out. Father, I thank You so much today that Your Word, Your character and Your care and Your work is enough. We don't need anything. It has already been done and it's been done by You. So Lord, in the midst of our fear right now, we actively right now start to put our trust on You. We're actively trying to do that, God, in our mind and our spirits when everything is working against us. Lord, we want to do that. We need Your power to do that. If you're in the room today and uh, you need to confess Christ, would you use this moment? to do that call out to Him right now. If there's something you're afraid of right now, you're wrestling with something, you're beat down, overwhelmed, and feel alone, would you just be honest with God? It's a safe place to do that here. You don't have to be perfect here. You can be honest with God no matter where you are. You're dealing with something, dealing with somebody, tell God right now. Talk to Him about it. But don't just stop talking to Him about it and telling Him about it. Turn to His Word. Turn to His character. Rely on His work. And feel His care. Right now. Heavenly Father, we all come before You. We know You're ushering us into a season of mission, vision. We know we're going to be met with opposition and that it's going to be pushed back on all that's comfortable for us. And so we ask, God, that you would really you begin to prepare us right now for the fight. Prepare us, God, right now for bigger things. Or strengthen us in unity as your people around your word, your character, your care, and your work. That nothing else would matter except the mission of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Strengthen us personally. Strengthen us in our marriages, in our relationships. Strengthen us as a church as we try to strengthen and attempt to follow you and strengthen our community and our world by becoming a blessing like we've been confessing all summer. Help us to do that, God. Make your face shine upon us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand